In a previous video, I have defined spherical sources and complex sound fields are made by a combination of spherical sound sources. So it's important to see how they reflect. Um, let's consider the, the situation that is shown here in, in picture uh, A. We have a point source that is located at coordinates uh, capital X, capital Y, capital Z. That we, well, that's the source position, and then we have another point, Q, which is the receiver, let's say a microphone, where you want to calculate the sound field. And the source that is at P is a, is a spherical uh, source. And it is located above a reflecting plane S, which we assume to be perfectly rigid. Well, we, we know that there is a general principle that a reflecting surface acts like a mirror and in fact creates a secondary virtual source symmetrically from uh, the, 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 the original source. That's what we see in picture B. We have located another source at position P prime with coordinates X, Y and minus uh, Z, assuming that Z is the vertical uh, axis. And indeed this works because the secondary source, and that's what we see in picture C, uh, the secondary source is creating locally on the plane an acoustic velocity vector that has the same components in the direction parallel to the plane, but an opposite velocity in the direction perpendicular to the plane, so that the sum of the two create locally on the plane a zero normal acoustic velocity contribution, which is indeed what we wanted. So creating the uh, reflected source, uh, the, 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 the image source, is um, making sure that the boundary conditions are uh, satisfied. Now I'd like to talk about a very important thing in, in room acoustics, which is called reflectograms, or the impulse response of the source, of the room. Um, most of the course is working in the frequency domain, but here I'd like to work again in the time domain and consider, as is shown in the picture, that the excitation is not a continuous signal at a certain frequency, it's not a harmonic source, but it is an impulse source. Here on the picture you have somebody uh, 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 sh shooting uh, with a revolver, uh, and that's indeed how rooms are tested. We have special um, uh, test guns that can be used to create a very brief impulse, but you can also just clap your hands. And we're interested to see how the sound goes from the source to the receiver. So we'll start again with the simplest situation where we have one point source placed above a reflecting plane. And you see the source, uh, you see the receiver, which is the little gray dot, and uh, you emit uh, a sound and uh, we are looking at the successive position of the wavefront. And uh, this is it, you have spherical wavefronts that are leaving the source, progressively uh, progressing, uh, but when the, the sound, the, the, the wavefronts are hitting the ground, they are reflected and reverted, and we have these uh, wavefronts. And it can be analyzed again in terms of uh, uh, image source because if you consider that the initial source just goes through the wall and the virtual source after a certain time becomes real, you see that the complex wavefront shape on the right can be analyzed just by combining the wavefronts of the original source and the uh, image source. But uh, now let, let's take a, a time domain viewpoints and assuming that uh, a single very short impulse is emitted by the source, what is going to be heard at the receiver? Well, we see in fact that uh, the sound field travels directly from the source to the receiver and so uh, if t equals zero is the time where the gun is triggered, then the sound is reaching uh, the source after a time r, the distance, divided by c, the sound field. And so in the diagram that you see uh, below, you have 
um, uh, you, that represents the acoustical events recorded by uh, the receiver, you see that you have a first impulse that is heard after a time r divided by c. But you see that there is a second uh, impulse that r comes from the uh, reflection of uh, the wave on the on the ground, and in fact, uh, this is when the the grey uh, wave fronts are reaching the um, uh, the receiver, and the, the the travel made by the source is from the source to the ground, and then from the ground up to the receiver. That's on the right side, and on the left side, it's interesting. In fact, you realize that. Uh, the, the second impulse that you uh, observe is, corresponds to a total travel, which is the distance between the image source and the receiver. And so on the echogram, when you have a, an impulse source above the ground, you hear the signal twice, once after a time r divided by c and one after a time r prime divided by c, where r prime is the distance between the image source and the receiver. Let's see how we can apply that to more complicated situation. And let's look, let's look at still a very simple and theoretical situation of a point source in green located near two perpendicular rigid surfaces. And in the first, in this graph, we first take a look, a very physical look at the location of the wavefronts. And you have four snapshots of the wavefronts at four different instants, uh, the black, the blue, the dark blue, and the red ones. And you see that they correspond to successive times, and they each correspond to the time where the wavefront is passing through the red uh, point, which is my receiver. And you see indeed that you have a direct field that's the first picture. Then you have a, a first reflection that reaches the, re the receiver, then a second reflection, and then a third reflection. But we can look at that differently by, uh, in a more geometrical way, by saying that the sound can go either directly from P, from the source to the receiver, can reflect on the ground, can reflect on the wall, and can do go through a double reflection first on the ground and then on the uh, on the wall and now on the echogram we have four different acoustical events coming at different times and they have different um, they carry different intensities uh, simply because they have made a longer travel and so the 1 over r dk or 1 over r square dk for the intensity must be taken uh, into account. Uh, yet another way of looking at it is in terms of image source and it's interesting. You see that uh, the sound source P is generating on the vertical surface a certain acoustical velocity component that to counteract that you have to create a symmetrical source P1 which we will indeed uh, cancel that component and ensure that the zero normal velocity condition is satisfied on the vertical wall. On the, uh, on the ground the source is also generating a, norm of a certain velocity, so you need a second image source to compensate. But that's not sufficient because the source P1 is going to generate a certain velocity component on the ground and the source P2 is generating a certain velocity component on S1. So that you need in fact a third source that I called P12, which is going to generate uh, velocity distributions on the two walls that are compensating. So you see that when you have two surfaces, you need to, uh, in order to satisfy the zero velocity boundary conditions on the two walls, you need to have image sources with respect to both walls, but you also have to take the image of the image. And indeed, you see that the sound field at the receiver point Q can be seen as uh, 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 coming from four different sources, the physical source, uh, 
the reflection with respect to the ground, the reflection with respect to the wall, and the reflection of the reflection, and happily here, uh, the image of P2 with respect to S1 and the image of P1 with respect to S2 is the same, but it's not always the case. Note that the image source method can be generalized, but it becomes very quickly difficult. Here we have a, a more complicated corner and you see that uh, the, 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 the sound goes from the source to uh, a wall, so you create an image source to calculate the second uh, propagation path, then another source for the third part of the propagation path, and then another one, but it becomes more and more difficult as uh, the complexity of the geometry increases, so that image source technique is interesting conceptually, but is never used as a, a, a a real methodology for calculating complex uh, sound fields. Now let's generalize again to a more realistic uh, cavity. We have now a, a room made of four uh, walls. It's a box-shaped rectangular room. We're in 2D to keep things simple. And now you understand that in order to take the, the, ref the perfect reflection condition at the walls, you have to create, you have an, a source inside the room, you have to create uh, image sources with respect to each wall, but then you have to take the image of the images, and then you have to take the image of the image of the image, and you quickly realize that this is a never-ending problem. It's like when you are standing between two mirrors, you see an infinity of yourself and so the reflectogram becomes a very dense reflectogram that is made and you have one line for each reflection uh, you have early reflections but then you can have reflections of very high orders which corresponds to reflection on multiple walls before uh, reaching the, the receptor Based on this consideration, I can introduce a very interesting and simple to understand methods for calculating the sound field in complex rooms, which is called the ray tracing uh, method. Let's look again at a single source, spherical source, above a plane. And instead of looking at the entire wavefront, let's just look at a very tiny part of the wavefront. And if we look at, at a very small part of the wavefront, essentially uh, this, this behaves like a plane wave. And you, we know that a plane wave uh, is reflected according to uh, the law of Descartes. And indeed, if we follow a certain wavefront along its propagation path, we see that locally, when it reflects on the ground, it uh, satisfies the Descartes relationship. And if we follow another one, it's true also. So that we can analyze a spherical source as a large combination of very small uh, plane waves that each propagate in different direction and that's the basis of the ray tracing method. Uh, what, what we are going to do is to consider a room, take um, um, uh, place a source in the room, define a, 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 a receiver a point where we want to measure the sound, and then we are going to discretize the, 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 sounds, the spherical sound source by a very large number, typically tens of thousands of uh, individual very small plane waves, and we are going to follow that plane wave all along its uh, reflections in, uh, in the room. And then we'll do, take the, not, the, the second ray, and then the third ray, and then the fourth ray. And we do that for each of them. And we just record the time where the, uh, the, the, the rays, the different rays, are hitting the, the, the receiver. And that will give us the reflectogram. At least it will give us a reflectogram in terms of 
arrival time. But how do we know the amount of acoustic energy carried by the ray, the residual energy of the ray when it crosses the receiver? Well, it's easy to calculate because it essentially depends on the uh, uh, the, the, the distance covered by the ray and the surfaces encountered by the ray. And the calculation takes into account three things. Depending on the distance, there will be a 1 over r reduction of the pressure amplitude and 1 over r square reduction of the intensity that we can take into account. Then we can take, but it's very second order, we can take into account uh, absorption in the air, but that's again uh, uh, something that is related to the distance uh, covered by, by the ray. It's something in exponential minus alpha times the distance covered. And finally we have to take into account what happens at the walls, because each time a ray Refl is reflected by a, uh, by a wall, it loses some energy and that will depend on the absorption coefficient of the wall. So if the ray reaches a surface with a certain intensity uh, I, the, 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 the ray after reflection will only have a residual energy 1 minus alpha times I. And so if we just record which um, uh, surfaces are being hit, uh, we can calculate all the energy that has been lost and therefore we know the uh, amount of energy carried by each ray when it crosses the receiver and that's what gives us uh, the, uh, the reflectogram. Now I give you some picture uh, of real-life ray tracing methods. Uh, they are produced by one of the reference uh, RTM software on the market, Audion software. You see uh, a CAD model of a concert hall and you see the, the rays uh, that are covered. We just look at the very simple reflections where the wave, the, 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 the sound goes from the source to the receiver with a single reflection because if the picture was showing all reflection you wouldn't see anything but we, of course in practice you are uh, doing uh, this including high order reflection so that's one picture here is another one seen from the side where you very clearly see the direct flights and the reflection on uh, backstage back of the room and essentially on the ceiling yet another one seen from uh, the top and here you see the reflectogram. On the reflectogram I insist on the fact that you do not only have information about the time of arrival of each ray and the energy carried by each ray but you have these two uh, little polar diagram on the right side uh, and to understand what they are you have to look at the little picture uh, above. The top one shows uh, a face seen from uh, the side. You know, you, you see the nose, the mouth and the eye and it tells you where the sound is coming from. Is it coming directly from the front? Is it coming from below? Is it coming from behind? And the other picture shows a head seen from above. You see the nose and the two ears and it tells you where the sound is coming from. Is it coming from the left, the right, the front, the back? And these two diagrams are very important uh, in room acoustics to understand where the sound is coming from because the best sound is sound that comes from all directions at once in a very uh, balanced way. But there's a lot to say about room acoustics that I have no time to, to, to cover. And of course you do not have to uh, define a single receiver, you can define multiple receivers and therefore the ray tracing method can be used to, to create maps of many things, sound level as a function of frequency um, and a lot of other indicators.